Father, thank you. Thank you for making it possible for us to see you. Without your son's righteousness being credited to our account, there's no way on this side of heaven that we could have a relationship with you that is meaningful and transformative, personal, that would enable us to be able to be a light for you in a dark place. Thank you, God, for making that possible. Thank you for loving us and sending your son the only one who could connect us with you. And then depositing your spirit within us. As David Tripp says, uh, Paul Tripp, Paul David Tripp, you literally unzipped us and put your spirit into us because you knew that between the gift of salvation and the ultimate gift of glorification that we would need your presence in our lives to be able to live the sanctification. So God, thank you that we're not alone today. Thank you that you're here. We do praise and lift up your name. And I pray now for your enablement, your anointing, as I share this word. And I'm grateful that it's not dependent upon me for what your word is going to accomplish in each of our lives today. But that it's by your spirit that you'll bring it to bear upon our hearts. And that this living and powerful two-edged sword will do its work today. Just help me to get out of the way. We wait on you. In Jesus' wonderful name. And God's people said, Amen. Well, two weeks ago, after discussing what it means to be neighborly or truly compassionate, as Christ modeled and the Good Samaritan demonstrated, I headed out to mow our lawn. My goal was to beat the rain before it arrived and prior to our Monday trip to PA. But before I could start the mower, I'm in my shorts, the shirt is on, I'm about to start the mower, I heard a familiar voice. Hello neighbor, do you have a minute? Now I wish I could tell you my schedule was subservient to my compassion. But here's what came out of my mouth. Well, I'm trying to cut the lawn before it rains, and and then I remembered my closing challenge to each of you. In the week ahead, I just didn't expect it to happen on Sunday. Ask God to show you someone in need you can be a neighbor to. And when your paths intersect, recall Jesus' words. Go and do what? Likewise. Okay, Lord, in my heart I said, not my will, but yours be done. What do you need, neighbor? For the next ten minutes or so, I assisted him. I was up on a ladder with his gutter trying to help him get that figured out. Why? Because he was concerned about the impending dismal forecast. And he needed some help. What about our lawn? I finished it just as the first drops began to fall. God took care of it. Fast forward to Tuesday, as we took our seats at Sight and Sound's Lancaster's Theater's newest production of David. Of the hundreds of folk that were in attendance that particular showing, we just happened to sit down next to a young ministry family from Maryland. They had three young children. Ellen introduced herself to Terry, the wife and mother of this brood. And then this woman asked her, what advice can you give me for raising children in the midst of ministry. Because that's a different ball of wax. Raising kids is tough any way you cut it. But ministry families, there's some unique things that they have to deal with and contend with. Ellen's response, I'm on vacation. Don't bother me. That was the response. Instead, she chose to be a compassionate neighbor to a stranger and to share words of encouragement and hope. Not to be outdone, I made a new friend in the restroom during intermission. <laughs> Ladies, you're not the only ones capable of such a feat. I met an older gentleman 
over the bathroom sinks. We're getting ready to wash our hands. Both of us were struggling to turn on the tap. He's waving underneath, and I'm waving underneath and doing this. And you're kind of hoping no one's watching. There's a little handle sticking out, so I started turning it to the left, turning it to the right, and nothing's coming out. I'm going, Lord, what? This works. Other guys are washing their hands. And so finally I realized you had to lift up on the lever, lever uh, to get the water to come out. And so I then assisted him, and he grabbed the actual faucet and was trying to pull that up. I said, no, the lever here. And so da-da-da. As we exited the restroom... Before doing that, I said it kind of makes you wish for the good old days, doesn't it, when they just, the taps just turned, and you could, you could figure that out. I discovered as we exited that he was uh, 60, he's married uh, 63 years. His wife had died three years earlier, and they had always attended the Sight and Sound shows. He was there that day with his daughter and granddaughter, and he said, you know, I don't know why God is keeping me around. And I said, well couple of things I think he still has something for you to do and when your mansion is ready he's working on it when it's ready your savior will call you home it's going to happen and so I made a friend in the restroom why do I share all this because human needs come in various shapes and sizes there's all kinds of needs they're financial emotional uh, physical spiritual social mental being neighborly or ready to assist anyone that needs our help or to whom we have an opportunity of doing good, according to Webster's Dictionary, is part and parcel of Christian experience. It's part of the journey of being a follower of Jesus Christ. But is it ever right not to be neighborly? What if the need we encounter beyond our means to meet? What if it exceeds our resources? What then? That's an interesting question, but one worth exploring. So let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Is it ever right not to be neighborly? Page 1083, if you want to follow along from our Pew Bible. What color is it? Burgundy. Yes, we've heard it so many times. Turn to page 1083. You'll be right at 1 John chapter 3. Let's begin reading at verse 16. By this we know love. And this is God's divine agape love. Because He laid down His life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's, that's huge, isn't it? That certainly speaks to sacrifice and doing what we can for others. But verse 17, whoever has this world's goods, whoever has financial means or possessions and sees his brother in need and shuts up, locks up his heart from him, slams the door, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children... Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. James reiterates this New Testament truth while defending a faith that works, a faith that's genuine. If a brother or sister is naked or poorly clothed and destitute of daily food or lacking in basic sustenance, and this now equals legitimate needs, they don't have the clothing they need or the the food they need. And one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Basically, your words are worthless. John's letter is clear, as the message indicates. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, you have enough to live on. You have enough to assist others. But turn a cold shoulder and do nothing. What happens to God's love? It disappears. And who made it disappear? Question, is every person, any person, 
capable of meeting every need? Answer, no. Such a task is humanly impossible. It'll, it'll burn you out if you have that perspective in life that I have to meet every need that crosses my path. We can, however, meet specific needs whenever they're within our means or don't exceed our resources. What do I mean? In the case of the Good Samaritan, he possessed monetary and material assets to care for the man who was robbed, beaten, and left half dead beside the roadway. Am I saying someone without those resources should just pass by on the other side, totally ignore such a victim? Not at all. Do what you can, do what I can, but the scriptural principle still remains. It's a general guide or boundary. If you don't have the means to do something about a particular need, again, whether financial, emotional, physical, spiritual, social, or mental, don't berate yourself. Don't get stuck under that cloud of chronic guilt. God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in, some of you know it, every mine, He has innumerable assets at His disposal. He is capable of providing for every need. Just as He did for Old Testament Israel. Just as He continues to do for New Testament saints. Why does understanding this matter? Because I think we're prone to two extremes. Two extremes. Either we fail to do anything, or we foolishly assume too much. Two extremes. John was resolute about God's redeeming love. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Love that professes while it does not act is not true love, writes G. Campbell Morgan. Love which acts is love in truth. Followers of Christ understand that divine love manifests. Divine love reveals itself. But the danger of apathy still exists. It lurks in the corner. We can become apathetic and, and do nothing. Equally perilous is a chronic pursuit of tackling more than we're capable of. Or, or believing ourselves to be superhuman. I can do it all. Anybody ever try that? When you're physically or emotionally drained... You're recovering from a season of spiritual discouragement. You're not in a healthy place at that point. You're not in a spot where you're going to be able to assist anyone. So rather than piling one more thing on your plate, take a cue from Jesus' example. Mark talks about the twelve returning after being dispatched to proclaim the gospel. And they report what they have done and taught. And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. Ever been there? Anybody there right now? It was everything you had just to come today? Take rest. A field that has rested gives what kind of a crop? A bountiful crop. Bottom line, it's okay to take a break on occasion. Give yourself permission to take a break. There will always be needs to meet. There will always be folk to be neighborly too. But self-care, when needed, isn't selfish. That's not original with me. I learned it from a seminar this week. Self-care, when needed, isn't selfish. On top of this, when it comes to avoiding the extremes of failing to do anything or foolishly assuming too much, what about all those who walked away from Jesus? Did Judas have a need? Survey said. Oh, Judas had a need. But when he left the upper room, Jesus let him go. 
He didn't say, wait a minute. You're walking away from the one guy that can give you what you really need. He let him go. And what of the rich young ruler who felt he could earn his own salvation by simply adhering to the commandments that it's within my power to pull this off. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. That's the only time this phrase appears in Mark's Gospel. The only time it says of Jesus that he loved someone. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. How did he respond to the Lord's ultimatum? Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had what? Great possessions. And Jesus did what? He let him go. He did not run after him. Doesn't sound too neighborly. Doesn't sound too loving. But as London pastor and author Jaunty Alcock notes, Jesus demands it all. That is the command. And there is no budging. It's not just a hard command. It's impossible. And it was supposed to be. Why? Precisely because of Christ's preeminent love. Love was behind this conversation. He loved him. Jesus loves us far too much to stroke our egos and tell us how fabulous we are, adds Alcock. Instead, he issues commands far beyond our ability to obey in order to drive us to him. What was it he said about the kingdom of heaven? Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. How do children receive the kingdom of God? By faith, not by fleshly self-effort. Will by no means enter it if only the rich young ruler had owned his inability, his lack. Lord, this is beyond me. I cannot pull it off. I need you and you alone. Instead, he hung his head in sorrow and shuffled away. Sometimes a neighborly or compassionate step is to let someone walk away so they might recognize their true need. Are you with me? At other times when need exceeds your resources, whether externally or internally, find another Christian brother or sister. Someone who's in a healthy place and able to assist. Then, when you're back on your feet, whether financially or emotionally, return to the game. Pick up the baton of being neighborly and start running with it again. Now, before setting the stage for a new sermon series, allow me to share a final example of the life of Christ in answer to the question, is it ever right not to be neighborly? Turn over to Mark's Gospel in chapter 1. How many of you really like Mark's Gospel? I was hoping Mark would raise his hand. <laughs> he, he nodded his head. Chapter, uh, uh, page 882, 882, Mark chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse uh, 21. Jesus, of course, remember, Mark's kind of a condensed uh, Reader's Digest version gospel. It was for the, the Roman reader, and they just want action and immediacy, and, and don't, you know, give us pictures and don't make it long, because we don't have the time for all that. And so it's kind of this condensed version. Uh, he's he's uh, just selected the apostles, and we begin in verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum. That's that fishing town on the northwest shores of the Sea of Galilee. They became kind of the, the center, the, the, the hub of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. It was also the home of Peter and Andrew, James and John. You kind of, you get, you get one of them, you get all four of them. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered synagogue and taught and they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having what authority and not as the scribes whenever the scribes taught they validated their teaching by quoting past teachers that's who they had to to rely upon 
contemporary preachers, including this guy, uh, replicate the same practice. What do, what do I do a lot of times? I quote various uh, Bible scholars, uh, authors, and, and teachers of, of Scripture. But when you're the son of the living God, when you are the author of life, who do you quote? Think about it. He taught them as one having authority. Why wouldn't he? He was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the... You can't go any higher than that. Isn't that cool? Look at verse 23. Now there was a man in their synagogue with what kind of a spirit? An unclean spirit, an impure spirit an evil spirit. And he cried out saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? That was his earthly name. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That was his anointed name. But Jesus rebuked him. He cut him short saying, Be quiet, be silent, be muzzled, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Imagine you attending the synagogue that day and this unfolds. Go home and someone who was sick wasn't able to attend and they ask you, what happened at synagogue today? You're not going to believe it. No one went to sleep. Imagine if this occurred here. Ah! And all this kind of Then they were all amazed, verse 27. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey Him. You see, they understood that dimension, that unseen realm, was a reality. I don't, they're amazed, but I don't think they're surprised. I think today we've been duped into thinking, oh, it's just a fairyland thingy and Hollywood movies and people lollygogging along like there's no other realm. Immediately, because of this, his fame, verse 28, spread throughout how much of the region around Galilee. All of it, word was getting out. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon, Peter and Andrew, with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick, his mother-in-law, with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. So he came, took her by the hand, and lifted her up. You might need that today. You might need Jesus to take you by the hand and just lift you up because you came in as one of those individuals that's exhausted. Maybe emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Maybe it's a financial exhaustion. Maybe there's something else going on. He's in the business of taking hands and lifting people up. So let him do it. That's not in my notes. That's, that's a spirit extra. Because I don't know what's going on. But he does. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately, where did the fever go? It bailed. It left her. And she served them. You boys hungry? What do you want? It's a mother-in-law. This is what they do. No PT or recovery time. No extended rest. Just instant healing followed by hands-on service. That little word immediately appears repeatedly throughout Mark's Gospel. Because when Jesus heals, that's what He does. Instantaneous. Verse 32. Now at evening... When the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Why did these folk wait till evening when the sun had set before bringing their sick loved ones or possessed friends to Jesus? A couple of reasons. First, it was Sabbath. Meaning the Pharisees would have erupted over anyone being healed on the Sabbath. That's one reason. They didn't want to tow it up with the Pharisees. Secondly, you weren't allowed to carry any burdens on the Sabbath, including people in need. That was against the law or the rules of the Pharisees. You had to wait for a new day to begin, which came when? 
after the sun had set. So once they got past the magical moment, boom, we're all there at the doorway. Look at verse 33. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Whose door? Simon Peter's door. Then Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. I mean, we're talking needs galore here. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, a deserted place. And there he prayed. While the others slept, Jesus prayed. The Gospels mention 42 specific times that Jesus went apart to pray. 42. And Simon and those who were with him, they searched for him. They finally came to, Jesus is gone, where is he? Why were they looking for him? When they found him, verse 37, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Lord, they're seeking you. Their needs are tremendous. Why are you tucked away in this desolate and secluded place when everybody has got an issue? You're not being very neighborly. Look at verse 38. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Go back to chapter 1 of Mark and look at verse 14. Chapter 1 and verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel, announcing as a herald the good news of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's drawn near. Repent and believe in the gospel. After reaching a repentant tax collector named his short little guy, what was his name? Zacchaeus, Jesus restated his purpose or life's mission. For the Son of Man came to do what? Seek and save the lost. He would issue a similar statement to Pontius Pilate shortly before his crucifixion. Then Pilate said, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Did Jesus flesh out this primary goal or ministry purpose? Did He fulfill His God-ordained mission? Was he faithful in being a divine neighbor or delivering what people really needed rather than giving them what they wanted? Check out verse 39. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Oh yeah, he fulfilled his mission. Is there ever a time not to be neighborly? It would seem there is. First, whenever the need exceeds your means or resources to meet, whether financially, emotionally, physically, socially, mentally, spiritually, on those occasions, the principle to follow is this. Do what you're able to or God's love encourages, but delegate what you can't handle to others who will. Are you with me? Secondly, is there ever a time not to be neighborly? Yes, whenever a need disrupts or deters God's greater purpose for your life. That's another time to say, I can't because of this. Jesus left Capernaum. Go back to verse 38 of Mark's Gospel in chapter 1. I told you to turn back to chapter 1. We never left it, right? 
I'll, get, I'll catch that in second service. He said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. I've come forth from, I've exited Capernaum. I've left for a reason. My higher purpose to proclaim the good news. What did Jesus leave behind in Capernaum? A slew of unmet needs. There were still people looking for him that had needs. But he left them behind for somebody else to take care of. And he went to proclaim the good news. And by doing this, he modeled for us the priority of living for God's kingdom purposes. Which, when possible, include being ready to assist anyone that needs our help or to whom we have an opportunity of doing good. Being neighborly is a part of it. Now there's a third example of being neighborly, and it's one I want to use to introduce a, a, a new sermon series. It appears in John's first epistle. It's kind of a dark, but here's what it says. Do not love the what? World or the things in the world. In other words, stop being neighborly with the world's ways or the world's goods. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Or as the message reads, love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Recently we looked at the fruit of the Spirit or fruitful living. What the Spirit of God produces in our lives as we abide in Christ, according to John 15. But along with reproducing Jesus' life in us, there are other things He likes to prevent. There are other things He wants to empower us to overcome, such as friendship with the what? World. So against this backdrop, here's your homework assignment for the week ahead. Spend some time reading and meditating in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Romans 6, 7, and 8. Specifically noting the role of the Holy Spirit in delivering us from what God disapproves of. Alright? Got it? Alright, let's stand together. We'll close in prayer. Thanks for coming today. I'm so glad you did. Father, we, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us into this incredible family. This, this universal body over which Christ is the head. We rely upon you, Lord, to, to live the life you've called us to live. Thank you for again for depositing your spirit, sealing us with your spirit, empowering us as we walk in the spirit to please you in every way and then to be a a mouthpiece for you to be the hands and feet of you to the world to those in need help us to find the balance what it means to be neighborly and when we it's not the right time to be neighborly for the right reasons and God that others understanding that you through others will meet the needs because there's not a one of us here that can do it all thank you again for this morning that we could share it together as a family of God, as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's in His name we pray. Amen. God bless.